So we've been working through a tour of the cell. And we've been actually discussing the cell membrane. It's like selectively permeable, it's a lipid bilayer. All of those terms have meaning. And in fact, where I had just let up on Wednesday was the notion that we actually can stabilize the cell membrane by inserting cholesterol molecules, which you can see here in yellow, into the cell membrane to help <coughs> keep those individual lipid molecules at the right distance apart to have optimal biological function. If we let them get too far apart, it becomes more liquid than it should be. If they pack too tightly together, it becomes more solid than it should be. You also notice that the surface of the membrane, uh, and especially the external surface of the membrane, has a bunch of stuff. A lot of this is actually made up of simple sugars, <clears throat> including molecules like glucose, galactose, and other types of sugars. The external surface of all of our cells have a unique fingerprint. And they're so unique that every individual has their own unique identity just like your own unique fingerprints. And that's really why those sugars exist, is so that things like your immune system can look at individual cells and they can identify a pattern that's present and say, oh yeah, that cell is supposed to be there. So when you have a foreign invading cell, such as a bacteria or other biologic material, viruses, fungi, um, larger macroorganisms like roundworm and things like that, they have a different appearance on the external surface of their cell, and your immune system can go, that cell is not supposed to be here. That's a foreign invading cell. So this surface material that we find on the outside of the cell membrane helps to identify The cell is it's supposed to be there or it's not supposed to be there. And this identity is maintained <coughs> by sugars. Now I'm not going to expect you to remember this. This is a pretty uh, pretty much a biology word, but that surface, it, it actually appears to be very fuzzy and makes the cells look like they're fuzzy. And it's called the glycocalyx. And so each of you have your own unique glycocalyx. And you're actually familiar, probably, with some of the properties of the glycocalyx. How many of you can tell me what your blood type is? So a few of you can tell me what your blood type is. Your blood type is actually a reference to certain sugars that are located in the glycocalyx, giving your red blood cells their unique fingerprint so that your immune system other cells can say that cell is supposed to be here, that cell is the, the cell that is a cell cell. Okay? So you've actually probably run into this biological entity before with blood type. If you've ever done anything with organ donation or have had family members that have done organ donations, you know they do, they do matching or typing. And they're looking at the surface of the cell to get a uh, as close of a representation to what's supposed to be there to limit organ rejection. Blood type, you got to get blood from similar individuals with similar blood type. Otherwise, you have a really bad reaction. Um, and it's not totally perfect. If you've ever gotten blood before, I don't know if any of you have less of a bad experience. I have it. It's not very fun. They give you antihistamines and other uh, immune depressive drugs so that you don't have this huge immune response that can actually be more problematic than you get with blood. So this helps to identify the surface of the cell. It tells us that the cell is supposed to be there. As we move across the cell membrane and move into the cell, what you're going to be surrounded by is primarily water. Cells and on the inside and on the outside are basically water. In fact, the cell has once been described as simply being a bag of water with other stuff dissolved in it, which is actually a surprisingly accurate description. The water is contained inside of a solution called the cytosol. So 
So hopefully you've run into that term before in previous biology classes. If you take the word apart, the Latin is derived as cell solution. <coughs> Anytime you see the term CYTO, you know that that's referring to a cell. So a cardiomyocyte is a heart muscle cell. Cytosol is the cell solution. And it's going to be the cell solution in which all of our chemical reactions occur, exchange of other molecules with the cell and the, between the cell, the locations of the cell across the cell membrane are all happening through the cytosol. It is a watery environment. A large component of this is water. And it depends on the cell, but we're looking really at anywhere from 40 to 60 or more percent of the total volume actually just being H2O. Just being H2O. <coughs> because it is a watery environment, the term that we use to describe everything that goes on inside of the cell is aqueous. So all of our metabolic reactions, chemical reactions that help the cell to live and to survive need to occur within this aqueous environment. So if they're not very good at occurring in an aqueous environment, they're probably not going to be a biological, a normal biological reaction. Now the cell solution, in addition to the water or the aqueous component, it contains what I'm going to just simply refer to as stuff. It's a really good scientific biological word. It contains stuff. So what exactly is all of that stuff? Well, one of the things that it contains is it contains all of our equipment. You may call those organelles. I'm referring to those organelles as equipment because they're tools that facilitate specific jobs. You probably remember some of the jobs. Mitochondria. Do you remember what mitochondria is? Yes, powerhouse of the cell, which is a very dumb definition, but every high school student gets that definition. It's where we generate things like ATP that help us to power all of our chemical reactions. So it's equipment. Membrane-bound organelles that hold proteins and are combinations of proteins and other molecules to facilitate work. So in addition to that equipment, the other stuff, one of the big ones, is a class of molecules called ions. Ions are molecules that hold a specific charge. You remember electrons? You know the the charge of an electron? It's negative. How about proton? Positive. What about a neutron? It's neutral. So if I have a molecule and I remove one of the electrons and I'm no longer balancing the number of electrons with the number of protons, I have one additional proton if I remove an electron. That means I have one additional positive charge that can have an influence. Whenever we have a molecule that does that, gets rid of an electron or gains an electron, it uh, assumes a charge. They're called ions. And some of the most important ions that you run into in biology are sodium, calcium, potassium, and chloride. And in fact, the ions are so important that when you discuss a lot of the physiology that occurs inside of mammals, you start with what is happening with the ions. So we're going to find ions, these charged particles inside of this solution. By the way, we also find them in the exterior solution, which is sometimes referred to as the extracellular fluid the fluid that's outside of the cell. And so we can actually create these unique distributions of ions on either side of the membrane. And so if I were to draw up a membrane on the external side, the extracellular extracellular fluid, ECF, I have a high concentration of sodium. On the inside in my <coughs> cytosol, which I'm going to call my intracellular fluid, I have a much smaller amount of sodium. The thing that's really unique about this 
is this makes the membrane act like a battery. What do we use batteries for? We use batteries to perform work. You put it in a flashlight, the work that perform is to turn a light bulb on. You can put it inside of a kid's toy, and the work that perform is to cause that kid's toy to function. Or you use it to drive around your living room and absolutely enjoy the heck out of it. Because we can do that inside of our cells as well, these ions and transmitting those ions across the membrane can actually allow us to do work, right? If I go over here to the light switch, it's not going to be sodium or calcium or potassium. It's actually going to be electrons. When I flip the switch, the light's going to come on, right? Or it should, yep, it comes on. The reason it comes on is because on either side of the switch, I have an unequal distribution of electrons. When that switch is opened up, it's like making that membrane permeable to those charged particles. They begin to flow. That flow is called current. That current is actually what's used to do work. Inside of a cell, I make this cell permeable. I select it to be permeable to sodium. Sodium begins to rush from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And it facilitates our ability to do work. And there's all different types of things that we can do. In fact, everything that you are doing right now, beating your heart, controlling your lungs, expanding and contracting your lungs, writing, sitting here thinking, all of it is facilitated at the very beginning based off of movement of ions across the membrane. In fact, I drive my anatomy and physiology students nuts because I can come in and I can just draw this picture here add in the concentrations of potassium and calcium, and I can lecture on just about 95% of all these colleges. All right, so in addition to the ions and the organelles that are in the cell, we also have energy sources. Anyone happen to know our biggest energy source in, in uh, a cell. Yeah, a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and it's produced primarily from glucose. So you consume glucose in your diet. That glucose, which is really at the very base of chemistry and biology, a molecule is just an organization of electrons. Then you have a carbon atom that has electrons organized around those electrons and join up with other electrons to form bonds. If I organize those electrons in bonds, I'm actually able to change the amount of energy that they hold. So if I can reorganize those electrons in new bonds, the difference in the energy between the first bond and the bond that's created can actually become usable energy for me to use for chemical reactions. So when we go from glucose to ATP, through a series of chemical reactions, all I'm doing is reorganizing the electrons, reorganizing chemical bonds to buy the biological ability to perform work, which requires ATP. So we call it energy currency in the cell. If you go over to Europe, to your American money, your dollars don't get over there, right? You have to exchange it for the euro. Glucose has value, just like the dollar has value, but it's not usable inside of the cell for chemical reactions. You have to generate a compete. So all of the machinery and the energy that's produced is also going to be located inside of the cell. Those three things become extremely important in not only cellular function, but organism function as well. And so if you're looking for what's happening in our organelle, What's happening with sodium and potassium and calcium and chloride as we move through the semester? What's happening with energy? Where is energy coming from? Where is it entering into biological function? All right, so let's now deal with each of our individual organelles. And I'm going to try to move through this relatively quickly because what I'd like to do. Not there yet. What I'd like to do is, um, for each of the organelles, identify it, show you what it looks like. What's this type of cell called again? Anyone remember? 
it's sort of an amalgamation of all different types of cells. It's a stereotypical cell. So I'm going to point out the organelle in the stereotypical cell, and I'm just going to give you kind of the brief three or four word definition of what the organelle does. So each of our organelles, along with ions and energy, provide a working capacity. In other words, we're going to use our organelle to generate the things that we need in order for life to continue in that cell, or all of your cells if you're a multicellular organism. All right, mitochondria. You've probably all seen mitochondria drawn in sort of a bacterial shape, and you've been told that this proves that millions and millions of years ago in an evolutionary history that some single cell organism that looked like a bacteria made its way into another cell, was not consumed by that cell's immune system, was destroyed, and it set up residence, began producing energy for that cell in this biotic relationship. And now we have eukaryotic cells that have organs. Mitochondria are the power producers, the energy producers. By the way, that's my abbreviation for energy. One of the things I learned this semester is biologists are extremely lazy. So we try to, I mean, we make all of this abbreviations. So energy, NRG producers. That idea that mitochondria made their way through a cell, it's called endosymbiotic theory. Anyone ever heard of that before? <laughs> and most likely, unless you went to a really good school, either it was breezed up or you don't know much about it, or you were told that it's evidence for evolution. Unfortunately, you've been really misled quite significantly when we look at all of the different types of mitochondria inside of the cell, the shape, which is called the morphology, so the morphology of mitochondria is vastly different than just simply everything looks like the bacteria. If you look at skeletal muscle, so if we're able to actually take a look at mitochondria in the skeletal muscle, it has the shape that's called a reticulum. When you take a cross section, so basically you can just shave off one small little thin layer, um, of muscle tissue, when you look at it, it has a very bacterial shape. But if you do that in series where you take multiple cuts, you kind of can build this three dimensional model. What begins to appear is that it's this network that's just embedded inside of the muscle. <coughs> if you look at the flagellar rotor inside a sperm cell, the mitochondria is a spiral shape that wraps all the way around the flagellar boulder to optimize energy production for that. The job. If you look at a variety of different types of plants and animal samples, cell cellular samples, there are bacterial shapes, there are spiral shapes, there are reticular shapes, mitochondria. And I think that actually in endosymbiotic theory is probably not very accurate in what we observe when we look at the totality of the data on mitochondria is that we have a very creative creator, a very wise and intelligent creator who designed a system to function optimally based off of the, the function and the need uh, of that system. So, in this picture, the stereotypical cell, you've got that kind of bacterial shape mitochondria okay, with a grain of salt. That's not stereotypical mitochondria. That's just one form of mitochondria that exists in a vast diversity, a vast array of cell types. Ribosomes are going to be our next organelle. There's two different types of ribosomes. There's the ribosomes that are associated uh, in the cytosol, just what we would call in a free state. We call those free ribosomes. Then there are ribosomes that are attached to another organelle that we're going to talk about in just a second, which is called the endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes are involved there, and in fact, they are the location for protein synthesis. 
So all of your proteins in the cell, humans between 200 and 300,000 different proteins are suspected. We don't really declare them no, we that crazy. Um, 200,000 to 300,000, and every time you need a protein, <coughs> you have to pull the information for that protein from the genome, from the DNA, convert it into this material called messenger RNA, and then it's that messenger RNA that goes and attaches to or interacts with the ribosome to sequence the amino acids into the right sequence to produce a final protein. So ribosome's kind of the uh, forward definition here. Ribosomes are responsible to convert genes from the DNA to proteins. Uh, there are a few things that I say to try to emphasize my point. One of those things is proteins confer all of the physiology. If you want to know how a system works, you look to the proteins. If you want to know how a chemical reaction occurs, you look to the enzyme that's catalyzing that chemical reaction, if that enzyme is a protein. Okay? So proteins become really, really important. Proteins confer all of physiology. Our next organelle is going to be the endoplasmic reticulum. We do have some ribosomes associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. When a ribosome is attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, that portion of the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It looks rough because of the ribosomes that are present. There is also parts of the endoplasmic reticulum that are not associated with uh, ribosomes, and so they have a much smoother appearance, and we call that a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, whether it is rough endoplasmic reticulum or smooth endoplasmic reticulum, is involved in taking those proteins that are being produced by the ribosomes and modifying them to help them get into their final functional state. So the short definition for endoplasmic reticulum, <coughs> the endoplasmic reticulum modifies proteins. Now I'm giving you a whole bunch of information, and I don't want you to see your shelves not. Some of you look like you are. Like, oh my gosh. If you know these basic definitions, I've been studying biology for almost 20 years now. And I'm very passionate about it. And I know a lot of you have probably had very limited exposure to biology. And Something's going to click here, and you're going to become a little bit more excited. But at the same time, don't overanalyze it. Oh, God, i got to be able to write a dissertation on endosymbiotic theory for the next month in February, and I just don't think I can do that. No, you don't need to do that. So, endoplasmic reticulum modifies our proteins. The smooth version is just simply without ribosomes. Commonly, that's referred to as just simply the smooth ER, ER standing for endoplasmic reticulum. The rough version, the rough ER, is just where there are ribosomes that are present. There's a stack of pancakes inside of a cell. And that is called the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus. This is another organelle that we have in the cell. And the Golgi complex or the GC is actually the UPS of the cell. All of these proteins that are being produced, some of them stay in that cell where they're produced and they help that cell function. But a lot of cells, they produce proteins and they have to be sent out. A good example are the beta cells of the pancreas that produce insulin. <coughs> you all probably know that insulin has to do with regulating glucose levels in the bloodstream. If you don't do that very well, you might be a candidate for diabetes. If you do it well, then you have normal physiology. Insulin is produced in the pancreas in a specific cell called the beta cell, but it's released into the bloodstream so it circulates absolutely everywhere. 
and it affects skeletal muscle physiology, it affects liver physiology, it affects adipose tissue, fat tissue physiology. So we have to actually package it up and deliver it. Where it's packaged up as it's produced is going to be this thing called the Golgi complex. This is like the UPS of the cell. So we pack up these proteins. And what you can see here, this is the model representation of the Golgi complex. And what you can see are these little kind of bowl-shaped packets that are being produced by the Golgi complex and then they sort of let off. That's a really great scientific word. It's kind of release off in this little packet. If that packet that carries all of those proteins. So the Golgi complex shoves all these proteins inside these little vessels releases those vessels into the cell, and they either get distributed elsewhere in the cell or get distributed up to the cell membrane and get released and release the contents out into uh, the surrounding fluid. Those are called vesicles. So these little packets here, they're called vesicles, and those little vesicles just simply carry proteins. other stuff. It doesn't necessarily just have to be proteins, although proteins are very common. It could be waste products, um, some sort of metabolic reaction that can get rid of the release so that the urinary system can release into the uh, external environment. There are some other uh, little packets inside of uh, the cell. Um, here is one of them. It's called the peroxisome. These little tiny uh, packets, they basically, they're basically like a garbage can, right? Why do we have garbage cans? Because we don't want to just throw garbage all over the floor where we live. So we have these little packets where we can put the stuff that we don't want. Inside of the cell, the garbage can is a cell. We have these little packets where we can throw the waste products. Every time you convert something, or every time you um, undergo a chemical reaction, you have a waste product that's produced. Some of those waste products can be neutralized. But some of them are toxic and they have to be packaged away and gotten rid of. <coughs> so the peroxisome is one of our waste disposal products, and the other is called the lysosome. Lyse just simply uh, that just simply needs to break up. Proxisome and lysosome, these are the waste baskets. So they're going to aid in waste disposal. Now, the most prominent feature inside of a cell is the nucleus. <coughs> And our nucleus is what contains our genetic material. In humans, we have 3.5 billion nucleotides that make up our genome. These are 3.5 billion individual A, G, C, Cs. They're distributed across uh, 46 individual chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. It's that information which, don't, uh, don't miss this. The amount of information that's packed up in something as small as a tiny cell, we are struggling in uh, computer science to put the same amount of information on a reasonable size inside the heart. So we package more information into the cell, or there is more information packaged in the cell than in our limited intellect, we are capable of packaging onto a physical space that's much larger than the cell. In that genome, for humans, it's estimated right now that there are between 20,000 and 30,000 unique genes. And then from those unique genes, we produce 200 to 300,000 unique proteins that confer physiological function. If anyone know who the first genome we ever see was in human robots? This guy named James Watson. You should recognize that name because he was one of the two guys that helped, or one of the many people that helped to restate the structure of DNA back in the 1950s. 
Inside of our cell, and it's not shown here real distinctly, the cell, even though it can have a nice structured membrane, it still needs some additional support. And that additional support comes from a proteinaceous structure that's sort of like a lattice work that just kind of exists inside of the cell. It's called the cytoskeleton. So if I were to draw this out, inside the cell I have these fibrous proteins that are all sort of worked together that you can kind of picture that in three dimensions. It helps to give additional support and structure to the cell. So that's the support infrastructure. Now there are a bunch of other um, features that can show up on the membrane. You can get these little folds and things like that. And we'll talk about some of those things in the very specific organ systems, and in particular inside of the uh, respiratory system, <coughs> the digestive system. Those folds in the membrane will come up, and, and we'll touch on those at, at that time. Um, what I want to do now is I want to shift gears here just a little bit, and I want to talk about cell sounds. Hopefully you all agree that cells are small. Why are they small? There's so many. Okay, because there's so many of them. There, okay, there are actually two reasons why, or, or there are two limits rather, uh, on why cells exist in the size that they exist. You have an upper limit where we're never going to find a cell that's much bigger than that, and you have a lower limit where you're never going to find a cell that's much smaller. And both of those have a reason why there's cells that are not bigger. Why can't we have a cell that's the size of a face? It would make my job studying the cell a lot easier than it could actually. And then the lower limit, why can't we have cells that are even smaller? So cell size, the question I already posed. Why are cells so small? Uh, another kind of writer question could be why the cells not get smaller than they are. So I want to first address the upper size limit. The largest cell that we know about is about the size of a period on a standard textbook page. And that's going to be the ovum, which is the female mammalian sex unit. It's the, the cell that carries the genetic material from mom. That's still pretty small. Um, we're looking at about a tenth of a millimeter. So why don't we find cells that are bigger than that? And what it comes down to is a relationship between the surface area of the cell and the volume of the cell. So if I increase the volume of a cell, that's going to make the cell bigger, right? Increase the volume, the, the cell gets bigger. So think about this cell here, represented it as a cube. And if I increase the volume, it gets bigger. Now, how do I measure volume? What are the units I typically use? Something cubed, right? And the way that I can measure the volume of these three cubes is I can measure the length, the width, and the depth. And I can go from there and begin to calculate. I can calculate uh, the total volume in a unit such as a millimeter cube, something like that. Well, if I increase the volume of an object, like a cell, I have more volume and space that I need to regulate and maintain, which means more chemical reactions. And this is where really the limit comes in. More chemical reactions means more waste that's being produced. So what if we all had to live in this room together? The 
assuming that the biggest students didn't eat the smallest students, we would begin to accumulate waste in here, right? Then we have just one trash. Maybe for the first couple of days, we'll be all right. But pretty soon, that thing's going to begin to overflow, right? So what if I add even more students in here? We got even more waste. And pretty soon, it becomes totally on little. So as I increase the space, I increase the volume, I increase the waste that's being produced. By increasing volume, I increase the waste removal and the nutrient demand uh, uh, requirements. I have more waste that I need to remove, and I have more nutrients that I need to intake to maintain the living nature of the cell. In a cell, how do I get rid of waste and how do I how do I pick up nutrients? It's probably centered around the selective nutrient of the biomass. Right? This, this, the, the membrane is where all of this happens. If I want to get rid of some trash, some waste from the cell, I push it out through the membrane. The more volume that I have, the more membrane that I need in order to move that waste across and, and to, order to, to bring the nutrients back. How would I measure the membrane? I would, me I would measure that membrane not as a volume, but as a surface area. And so now I'm measuring in two dimensions, not three dimensions. And this is going somewhere, maybe. So in order to meet this increased waste removal and nutrient demand requirement as we increase volume, we need a larger surface area. Now, we already determined that volume, we're going to increase in a cubic fat. Surface area represented by the membrane, we would increase by a square fat. And if you start to do the math here, what you would see is as you increase any one dimension, the volume and the way that volume increases outpaces the surface area increase. In other words, volume increasingly increases disproportionately Hopefully I spelled that right. Disproportionately. Volume increases disproportionately to surface area. Because of this disproportion in volume and surface area as we increase in size, the volume, which is related to what? Waste removal and nutrient requirements. That waste removal requirement and that nutrient requirement are going to outpace the surface area's ability to meet the demand. So just by getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and what you can see here is um, surface area is five meters squared, and then down here it's one uh, or five uh, five millimeters, no six millimeters squared, one millimeter squared here, and then I go up, just increasing the dimension by one millimeter. <coughs> surface area is now 24 which 6 to 24 is a factor of 4. Whereas volume is 8, uh, eight millimeters squared, 8 to 1 is a factor of 8. So everybody kind of see what I'm saying here? As you increase in size, 
that volume is changing by a much larger ratio than the surface area. And eventually we get to a point where there's too much volume, not enough mem membrane, and we can no longer uh, survive because we're accumulating more waste than what we can get rid of. So that's the larger limit, and it's probably someplace pretty close to the size of the oval, maybe a little bit bigger, but probably someplace close to that. There is also a lower limit. Is there a question? Feel free to ask. Don't be shy. Yeah. It's actually the, the old British stuff. <laughs> Accumulate. <laughs> Shall we modulate? Yeah, if you ever have questions on any of my handwriting, don't worry. I will clarify. Alright, so lower limit. There is a smallest size cell that we can get. Now, what do proteins do? Proteins confer physiology. Physiology is basically function. Function is life. And so if I begin to lose the number of proteins that I can produce, I begin to lose my function required for life. Okay? And this is how it's going to fit in with the lower limit. So this time, we're decreasing size. So if I decrease the volume, I have to decrease everything else. And that includes the nucleus. What's in the nucleus? It's my genetic information. That's where I actually store the information to produce all of my proteins. So as that volume decreases in size, as the overall volume decreases, I have to get rid of some of the genetic information. And eventually I'm going to get rid of enough genetic information that I no longer can produce an adequate number of proteins in order for that cell to be considered living. <coughs> that information is critically important in order to produce proteins so that we can produce physiological function. It's that physiological function that gives us life. So as I lose physiological function, I tend towards death. So as volume decreases, we have less room for information. That's just because simply we're collapsing that nucleus down. And we have to get rid of some of that genetic material. Some of the DNA has to be removed in order to store the other DNA that's still in there. So with less info, that means less function, less proteins. We have the capability to produce fewer and fewer proteins. And eventually we're going to lose critical protein, and the cell is no longer going to have enough information, and life is going to cease. Lose enough information and life ceases. Uh, at the end of the semester, so it's still like 14 weeks away, we're going to talk about a, um, an organism called nanoarchaea quantis. Nanoarchaea quantis is the smallest known living organism on the planet. And its genome is right around 500 base pairs. We're at 3.5 billion in humans, they're right around 500,000 base pairs. And we don't find anything below that, so that's right around the, the, the smallest one. It's, it's a really small archaea. Um, we're going to talk about it for some other reasons. Uh, I'm going to use it as an example of why the irreducible complexity that we can see the inside of the cell could not have just come along by chance of random, um, random events. So we'll come back to that. Now, I've already told you that we have to transport stuff into and out of the cell. It'll probably be pretty uh, uh, 
beneficial to know how that happens, right? And there's actually several different mechanisms that are used. And I'm going to break this up by the number of molecules that are moved across in a given transportation. And I'm going to break it up into two ways. I'm going to break it up into just a single molecule moved across versus a large number of molecules moved across all at one time. Single molecule, we just call single molecule transport. Many molecules all at one time, just like UPS does bulk transport, we call that bulk transport. We're moving stuff in bulk, our material across the membrane. We'll start out here with single molecule. In other words, how do we move a single molecule, it might be a sodium ion, it might be a molecule of glucose, how do we move those molecules across the membrane from the membrane selects for those molecules across? One of the ways that this can be done is just passively. In other words, when the membrane becomes permeable to a substance, the molecule just naturally crosses. Think about being on the subway platform, maybe up in DC or up in New York City. When you walk down there, middle of the day, and it's loaded with people, and that train shows up, what happens? Everybody pushes onto the train. And why do they do that? Because they want to get away from it. And God, your guy's picking his nose over there, and the lady who's singing, all of these other people, right? We want to move away from these high density areas with creepy people to hopefully a place that we're able to find a seat that's lower density. Molecules do the exact same thing. If I have a bunch of sodium up here, if this whole room is a cell, I have a bunch of sodium up here, and there's no sodium over there, sodium's beginning to travel over this way. And it just doesn't. It's facilitated by this phenomenon called Brownian motion, which is the random motion that all molecules have. As water moves around, it just doesn't st stay still. It moves all over the place. It's just a char characteristic of the molecule. And it bumps into other particles, and just like pool walls on a, on a pool table, it begins to bounce around. Okay? Passive transport relies on an inherent characteristic that all matter tends from high concentration to low concentration. If the membrane is permeable and we have a concentration gradient, high concentration and low concentration, molecules are going to begin to go towards that lower concentrated area. And that's just simply called passive transport. Why do we call it passive? One, because there is no energy requirement. We don't need things like ATP. We get the impetus to move because all matter, molecules are matter, matter and molecules travel down, and I'm going to give you a symbol here real quick, and I want you to commit it to memory, they travel down a two brackets and the word GRE. That stands for concentration gradient. So molecules travel down a concentration gradient. This symbol here in chemistry is how we denote concentration. And then GRAD just represents gradient. So read this how? Concentration gradient. So molecules travel down their concentration gradient. That gradient is defined as the difference between a high concentration and a low concentration. All right, that's all the time I have. Enjoy your Monday. I will see you next Wednesday.